Whether the day decided to rise in a warm or sullen mood, mornings on the campus rarely differed. The pattern of the heaving buses began the first movement, and the contralto of the songbirds eased in the orchestra, bringing the silent symphony of the night to an end. However, on a fateful Tuesday, a faint dissonance seemed to echo throughout the atmosphere. Something unusual had awakened with the dawn. Sometime the night before, a fog had rolled in, settling over the campus. And come morning, the fog had yet to release its vaporous claws from the earth. The day, however, still commenced as always. The first clumps of students emerged from their dorms, threading through the labyrinthine campus like streams that emptied into lecture halls. If the lecture halls were oceans to the streams of students, then Professor Simon's Hall was more like a puddle, harboring the few still taking the medieval literature course. For years now, the department's numbers had been steadily waning, and though he didn't show it, he was well enough aware that his legacy would soon be left for only the cobwebs to ruminate over. Yet he still taught his classes with enough fervor and energy to challenge his youngest contemporaries, his students clinging on to each and every syllable. As the blue sky dissolved into a cool, somber mauve, the fog had yet to give the campus any reprieve. Professor Simon had reached the part in his lecture where the green knight lifts his mighty axe over Sir Gwain's neck, slowly unfolding the story to his students. His hand, curled into a fist, ascended above his head, lingering there for a while, then slammed onto the wooden lecture stand, coinciding with the buzz of the afternoon bell. Regaining his composure, he pushed his glasses up the valley of his nose and remarked in a light, feathery voice, "That'll be all for today." All his students left the class with smiles on their faces, which put his heart on wings, reassuring him that it, this wasn't all futile. With the room silent, he organized his papers and began to stuff them into his suitcase, across which skated the patina of old age. Suddenly, from the back of the classroom came a deep baritone voice, shattering the silence. "That was a great lecture, John," said the voice. The man then unglued himself from his seat and emerged from the haziness of the professor's receding vision. "Dean Whittier," the professor warmly remarked, "Great to see you." "You too, John," said the smiling dean. "How have you been?" I've been all right," he responded, still collecting his papers. "Just trying to keep things as stable as possible, you know." "Too well," answered the dean. "How's Jessica doing?" "Oh, she's doing great," Professor Simon said with a smile. "She's pursuing her master's now, classic literature. Of course, she was always so brilliant. But what else can you expect with a father like you?" "Oh, heavens, no," remarked the professor, feigning indignation. "All she got from me was bad vision." Rose is where she got her brains. God bless her soul. The conversation subsided to an awkward silence, in which the professor stopped collecting his papers and remarked, "Scott, you rarely ever come here unless something's wrong. What is it this time?" The smile on the dean's face faded to a look of quiet apprehension. He then put his hands into his blazer pockets, staying silent for a moment before saying to Professor Simon, "I'm sorry, but it's that time of year again, John." And I've told you enough times," interrupted the professor. "It's not time yet. I've still got a few years left in me." "John, if anyone believes you, it's me," the dean somberly remarked. "But it's just not me this time. The board's really pushing for it too." "Really?" submissively said the professor. "Look, John, we've both known for some time that this was coming to an end. Look at what you've done for yourself, though. You've built a great legacy." The dean paused for a moment. And averted his eyes to the floor, not wanting to look him in the eyes. We'll all have to stop sometime. The dean then momentarily placed his hand on his shoulder and exited the classroom, letting the professor wallow in his embarrassment. The professor finished collecting his papers, clicked his suitcase shut, and walked out of the room, turning from one more look as if to save the image in his mind. When he got into his car, which he struggled to find through the thick fog, he just sat there for a while. Simultaneously thinking about nothing and everything, what else was there? The well of novelty had long ago dried up, leaving him staring down into the black abyss that inevitably awaits us all—the black abyss that took away Rose in one long and tearful caress. Calls from Jessica were becoming less and less frequent, and when she did call, it was just a standard conversation. His life had been reduced to monthly prescription refills and morning chest pains. Those were now the highs and lows of his elderly life. For a second, he shook himself out of his misery and exited the parking lot, headed home. At first, he was too caught up in the tangle of his thoughts to take note of the fog. 
but when his car seemed to become consumed by whiteness, he stopped and tried to gather his location. No landmarks or structures were discernible in the ether, leaving him with no alternative but to venture out into the white. He habitually pushed out his hands as if he was wandering in the dark, but so thick was the fog that he couldn't even make out his fingertips floating a mere few inches in front of his face. In a few steps, he lost sight of his car, which sent a shiver of panic down his spine. Unanchored to the material world, he bumbled through the fog, feeling for something to tether himself to. His aimless search pulled him around in countless circles and zigzags, until he finally tripped and landed on the pavement, his glasses falling off with the impact. Fumbling for his glasses, he began to feel the warm breath of a breeze start to touch his face. The fog then started to slowly thin, unveiling an image that, when sharpened by his glasses, rendered him speechless. Don't the stillborn scream festering in his throat, nothing, everything had disappeared. He looked behind him and saw the once calm and secluded hamlet of a town that the campus called home give way to endless gray skies, and far in front of him, the outline of a range of black mountains darkened the misty horizon. Underneath him, the rough pavement whose curves and bumps his wheels knew by name had flattened into smooth beige rock. His mind was desperately struggling to wrap its fingers around his predicament, when suddenly at the sound of a baritone rumbling, his terror quickly dissolved into awe. The jagged blots of blackness that formed the great mountain range ahead of him suddenly extruded upwards, unfurling into myriad winged creatures, dragons. They stood wise and regal with tendrils of smoke slithering out of their noses. They were so far, yet they seemed to reach out and touch the professor, who deep in his heart felt the sudden rekindling of a childlike passion as he looked up at what he first thought to be mountains, with a smile tugging at the corners of his lips, ready for the future. Make sure that you subscribe to my channel.